Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to Pro Manchester's weekly webinar with Grayling Communications. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Catherine. I'm the Membership and Events Manager at Pro Manchester. Uh, today I'll be joined by Kat McGettigan from Grayling Communications and Sasha Lord, who is the Nighttime Economy Advisor for Greater Manchester. Um, just before we get started, I hand over to Kat. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the, the Q&A um, option we have. So if you do have any questions for Sasha or Kat at any point during the webinar, feel free to drop them in there uh, and they'll hopefully answer them at some point if we have time. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Kat to get us started. I think I'm now live. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that intro. Um, so um, I, for those of you who have joined us for um, these sessions before on a Wednesday, you might have noticed we've had a little rebrand um, because we think it's really important as we move through the phases of COVID-19, you know, we're all in whether that's week six, week seven for some people. We've been really focused on that kind of phase of adapting and getting used to the kind of new reality. But the reality now is, as we know, lots of discussions going on about how we now move into the kind of recovery phase. And so we thought it was really important to actually rebrand this series a little bit and, and really reframe it more as a knowledge exchange and ensure that you're getting access to the kind of best of the best in the business and, and sharing their expertise and knowledge. So, those of you who've tuned in before, I'm obviously not Chris Peacock, my esteemed colleague, who normally gives you a bit of a roundup of what's been going on. And um, I'm actually um, going to do more of a kind of in conversation with format with Sasha, because we're really, really lucky to have Sasha with us here this afternoon. Um, and my role will really be to kind of host those questions. And as Catherine said, make sure that if you've got questions for Sasha or myself, please feel free to kind of put them into, into the question toolbar. Um, as I said, my role really here is um, I head up the Manchester team um, at Grayling. I've actually come back to the region in the last few months, having spent 15 years down in London. Um, so very interesting time to be expanding um, a business um, under lockdown. But um, I think it's really exciting to be able to have access and be able to talk to people like Sasha, who are really seeing day in, day out what's happening in the community right now. So I'm not going to labour on Sasha's introduction because I'm sure a lot of you know him and he's been responsible probably for a lot of great memories for a lot of people. Sasha and I are reminiscing about the warehouse project, obviously him is the kind of brains behind that and also Park Life Festival. And I think, you know, in Sasha's role as a nighttime um, economy um, czar for Greater Manchester, he has done an incredible job in the last few weeks to provide real inspiration and joy and just a bit of hedonism, frankly, for all of us in lockdown through the initiative United We Stream, which I think has had over 8 million global people tune in over the last four weeks. So an incredible example of how we've had to kind of adapt and pivot in times of lockdown. So I really wanted to kick off this, uh, I say Q&A, but I know both Sasha and I like to talk a lot. So conversation, in terms of just saying firstly, thank you, Sasha, for joining us. And thank you also for spearheading United We Stream. And I really wanted to just hear a little bit about you from you first about what was the inspiration and reason for setting up United We Stream? So can you hear me OK? To begin with, fine. So um, I'm fortunate enough to be part of a WhatsApp group of night advisors across the globe. Um, and there's some amazing countries in there, India, uh, Australia, uh, Lithuania, Amsterdam, you know, there's, there's 36, 38 in total. And I was watching what the people in Berlin were doing, actually, because in Berlin, everybody knows from the age of a nappy to the age of going up into a coffin, you're into techno house music. That's it. You're not into folk, you're not into jazz, you're into techno house. And the clubs there are huge and respected. So um, a guy called Lutz decided to put a DJ on in an empty club called Tressel techno club and he was hearing loads of his colleagues were, were desperate for money the, the government weren't helping them out so he said look i'm going to put a dj on it's free of charge you can you know we know times are hard but if you can donate one euro two euros three euros please do it and i thought you know what 
that is amazing. So I phoned him up the next day and I said, love the idea. Um, love everything you're doing in Berlin. Can we nick the idea for Greater Manchester? And he was really supportive of it. Um, and so that was, you know, I had four days to put that together with my colleagues at the, the, the mayor's office. And they were pretty tense days. And for the opening weekend, we didn't know whether it was going to work or not. So it was kind of a soft launch. And then the following weekend, the second weekend, I think everything aligned all at once. Sometimes as a promoter, things happen where they shouldn't happen to the success that they do. So we had the Hacienda on. It was a 12 hour uh, daytime party. And we're on the, the tail end of probably the worst week of news that we'd had regarding Corona. Um, it was a bank holiday and the weather was absolutely scorching. And it, for whatever reason happened, 1.5 million people tuned in to watch United We Stream that day. And it was phenomenal. And I think that gave birth to it. Um, and that was only three weekends ago. We now, you're right, we've had over 8 million people viewing it. Um, we're going to announce on Monday on, on Monday how much money we've raised. We're well into the six figures. And that's great. That's going straight back out to help people that, that really need it. And there are people who... Um, you know, have fallen through the gaps in, in the nighttime economy. You know, there are some great cultural organisations that will always get looked after, but the idea of this is to give the money back to the people who are really in a mess at the moment. So you might not consider the people that clean at the end of a nightclub, or you might not consider the sound engineers, the lighting engineers, you know, the people that should be working festivals, their money is wiped out completely. So it's, it's going to go directly to the, that type of, of person, which we're kind of really pleased about. Um, so no, it's exciting. I mean, you know, we I cancelled Park Life actually before the government suggested we did. Um, and it was a shame because we we're on 76,500 tickets, our capacity is only 80,000. So it's going to be the hottest festival we'd had, the quickest uh, festival that had sold out in, in you know record time so it was kind of gutting we were lucky that we were insured many many aren't um, and I actually think my partner Demi thought when I cancelled it this is great well I've got him for a few months now and then I came up with the United We Stream and it's just taken every single second of my time uh, and completely sapped but it's worth it and I think what's different about what we're doing with it is not just house techno. We're trying to appeal to loads of different people. So we're putting live music on there. We've had cookery classes with Gary Usher and Simon Wood. We're going to have comedy on there. It's not just about the big names for me. There's so much hidden talent across Greater Manchester. You know, I, I know as a promoter that I get sent so many mixes of DJs and bands, artists. Uh, you know, it's giving them a platform as well. On on Friday night, there's going to be many DJs playing that you've never heard of. So, and then, you know, there might be other promoters out there that think, yeah, actually, they're great. We're going to start booking them. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting time. Um, and it's the biggest platform in Greater Manchester now, reiterating, reiterating that message, stay home, stay home. So it's supported by all the authorities. And it, I think what's amazing... I think what's amazing to hear is that spirit of collaboration, which is cross borders from the sounds of it, from where you took the inspiration on, but also cross sector. And I think that was one of the things I was really keen to talk to you about is that sometimes there are, as you said, those forgotten areas in terms of, yes, we've had a lot of focus on talking about restaurants and bars, but obviously, you know, putting on a club night and running a venue is very different challenge to um, some of the other sectors. Um, involved and as you said I know you've championed as well people like doormen you know stuff like that that people wouldn't think about them in terms of you know what what, what does what do they face kind of coming out of work so in terms of you've obviously created this platform that's been great in terms of giving people a sort of a virtual way to pivot and adapt and still showcase and remain relevant while still raising money as you said that's going to go directly back into the nighttime economy what do you, you know, in terms of your access and speaking to the community at the moment, as I said up front, we're sort of moving now to this adapting to being online and virtual to start to think about as we start to reopen. What What is the general kind of, you know, if you were to sum up what the sort of feeling and kind of consensus of the community is feeling like right now, how would you summarise that? So, um well, in a nutshell, it's absolutely screwed. So when Boris Johnson came out on that Monday, um, I don't know, was it five weeks ago? And he came out and he advised 
people not to go to restaurants, bars, clubs. You know, that word advise closed the industry down overnight and it probably bankrupted many businesses because they were still fully staffed the next few days. They, they were full, fully stocked um, and advising people, they went from being sold out to having absolutely nothing. That was it. And the government hadn't really thought through how important the nighttime economy is. It's the fifth biggest industry in the whole of the UK. And in Greater Manchester alone, it's employed 414,000 people. The fear that went through um, you know, the whole of that industry for three or four days until they came out and actually did deliver some quite good messages was catastrophic. They've done some good things like, you know, the furloughing applies to us, um, hot holidays on business rates, VAT, things like that are great. But there are so many people that, again, have fallen between the cracks. And I think that applies more to the nighttime economy, more so than, than anything. And sadly, we are going to be the last economy probably to open. I think the good news is I'm now starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. And as we're speaking now, I know our mayor, Andy Burnham, has given a, a press conference uh, and I've just seen it. And he's announced that um, he's forming a economic recovery task force, um, which is headed up by Elise Wilson, who's the leader of Stockport. And feeding into that, he's asked me to put together a nighttime recovery task force. Um, and we are going to be putting out some very, very positive messages. I am now seeing light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we're talking about, OK, we were indoors. Now we're going to start talking about reopening. How does that look? When is it going to happen? Um, and I think we're very fortunate with our city region that we have a mayor that actually gets it. It helps that he loves live bands and he loves, you know, his musing and things, which gives a head start. And of course, when he was in government and sat in cabinet, not only was the, the health secretary, but he also <laughs> hold the um, portfolio for culture and, and media and sport as well, which helps immensely. So he understands where I'm coming from. Um, but yeah, we've put this panel together of uh, across our sector. So we've got um, hotels represented, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, theatres, cinemas, the police, um, museums, you know, anything you can think of to do with nighttime economy, there's representation on there. Um, and over the next few days, we're going to be giving our recommendations to the mayor. And, you know, I would like to think that in some way, shape or form, perhaps end mid to end of June, we might see some kind of return. I do think we'll be going to offices towards the end of May, is my understanding. If if you have to, we're still the recommendation of working from home. But if you can, if you need to go into the office, still social distance. That is that's like a, a calculated guess, but that is what I'm hearing from people who should know. Um, but no, we're definitely now into recovery. And I think, you know, um, I think that's a fantastic announcement to come from Andy and to hear that, you know, I think one of the things we should all feel a lot of confidence and um, comfort in, I guess, is that as a um, region, feels like we're always sort of slightly ahead of the curve. And I think that, you know, we've been very lucky to have so much kind of planning and kind of focus on that. One of the things I just wanted to touch on them with you there was around reopening. Um, because I think there's um, there's been t this week we've seen a lot of the big chains. So whether that's a Greg's or a Press or people like that start to open um, again. And I think there's a little bit of worry and I've definitely seen a lot of reporting um, is whether we end up becoming kind of very chain focused because the independents obviously are going to find it a lot harder to reopen than the big change because as we all know working in the sector you know margins are so tight and tough that it's actually sometimes to half open it's probably going to be more damaging economically than to not open at all and, on, and in terms of a city in a region who thrives on you know the amazing independence we've got you mentioned a couple of you know i've seen some of the chefs you've had on like Gary Usher being from Chester, obviously, you know, uh, in one of his fine establishments is in Chester. But what is your view then on the, could this be the death of the independent and the resurgence of the chains taking over again? So to answer that simple, I think the answer is no. Um, but going back slightly, just before that, 
uh, before COVID hit us, I was talking a lot about the traditional high street as we know it dying away. And we know the reasons why, you know, I, I'm at fault as well. On a Sunday night, I can sit on the couch and order my shaving foam from Amazon and I don't have to do anything. I know it's going to be delivered to the office on the Tuesday. <laughs> so the night <laughs> of popping up on the high street, and I always use as an example. I'm getting feet. Let me just let me check in now. That's better. Can you hear me still? So I use Altrincham as a, a perfect example. You know, five years ago, Altrincham was one of the most boarded up towns in the whole of the UK. Altrincham market happened, and then there's been a, a, a really good explosion over the last three years of very high quality food and drink offerings, all independent. And it's been amazing to see. And you know, the retail units came back, and last year. Altrincham won the best high street in the UK. So that's a real success story. So I, from my gut feeling is from dealing with the leaders and the chief execs and like-minded people, we're not going to allow the chains to come back in the way that they think they may be able to. You know, it's not going to be a very American approach. The independents are the lifeblood of the nighttime economy. And, you know, it's fine having all these, these chains, they serve a purpose. But for me, you know, if I go out, I like to go to an independent place where you can feel the passion from the owner. They're more creative. And, you, you know, you mentioned Gary Usher, um, who, who's an absolute creative genius. All right, he's a bit of a lunatic, but sometimes that comes with, you know, being a genius. I think there's a fine line, isn't there? Um, but yeah, they're the people that we need to be supporting. And they're the people that when we reopen, yeah, some of them, quite a few of them sadly may have gone bankrupt, but they are entrepreneurs and they will come back. And when they do come back, I urge everybody to support them. And even more so, I think we need to be supporting the people who have really stepped up during this crisis. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of strong examples of this. So, um, Greater Manchester Police got in contact with me to say they were running out of hand sanitizer, and because they knew I was into events and, and festivals were cancelling, did I know anyone with any hand sanitizer knocking about? So I just put something out on, on Twitter, and did be gin stopped their full manufacture of producing gin because obviously hand sanitizer has a, an alcohol base, and started creating hand sanitizer for Greater Manchester Police, which sorted out their problem immediately. So once we're through this, everybody, don't become an alcoholic, but support Didsbury Gin massively. They need it. Another one is uh, Mary Ellen, who's a chef who has a place called The Creameries in Shorten. She tied up with somebody called Corinne Bell, and she said to all the restaurants, look, you're closed. You've got a load of stock. It's running out of date. Give me your stock. If you've got any chefs on furlough who want to volunteer, get on board. They are churning out 7,000 meals a week for the most vulnerable people across our city, city region. The Ivy restaurants, amazing, 3,000 meals a week for our frontline uh, emergency services, the ambulance service, actually. You know, the, this, this happens with our city region. And I am flying the flag for Manchester because I'm a man, I was born in Manchester. And, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Every time we come under attack by whatever, we saw it in... On, on the back of the arena attack, uh, 22nd of May 2017, it doesn't matter whether you are a student, a lawyer, in PR, you're unemployed, you work in a bank, it doesn't matter. We all come together and we support each other and we look after each other. And, you know, the, I, I could go on about this for ages and ages. I know there are so many platforms like Manchester Review News, um, I Love Manchester, Manchester's Finest, uh, Manchester Wire, they have no income coming in at the moment because they're, they're not advertising. But what they're doing is they're still supporting the restaurants and saying, look, when it gets going now, we need to support. And I just think it's brilliant. Um, and I don't see this in, in other city regions. And I have operators coming to me to say they're taking inspiration from, uh, you know, our, our leaders across our city region. And, you know, it's great Manchester's great. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Well, hopefully everyone on the, this call is definitely of, of that belief as well, Sasha. Um, so I think there's, there's, as I said, there's a challenge between the independents and the mainstream chains. 
I think there's also this challenge between sort of this dichotomy of, you know, as I said, kind of establishments wanting to open, which is which is a challenge, as in there's a two camps on that side, as like, should we we open and be half open or should we stay shut? There's also then, if we look at the other side, the public thinking about, are people going to feel confident and ready to then, even if, you know, business owners feel that they can put, you know, safe distancing, they have got the, the staff to support and kind of in the right and appropriate way. What's your view on terms of, you know, people actually wanting to come back and be part of the nighttime economy again from a kind of consumer and public view? So I think there are two questions there. Um, the first one is about, you know, whether it's when you them to let them the first question is about whether you should open it or not. Now, restaurants would be one of the first places to open within the time economy because you can evidence social distancing uh, by separating tables. The problem with that is restaurants run on such a tight margin that if you're only running at 50%, which is probably the majority of cases, then there's no point you opening because you'd be making a loss. So we need to really look at that. I don't know what the solution is yet, but hopefully it'll come out of the task force. Um, but big restaurant operators I know and independents are sat in the camp that they would rather not open on at 50%. To answer the second question, um, I think, again, there are two camps. If you split people, I think the people that go to festivals and nightclubs and busy bars like Deansgate Lock, sort of the 18 to 25 year olds, immediately the second Boris says, right, you can go out. They are going to spring out of the back door like a rat up a pipe. You're not going to be like the Usain Bolt, seriously. They will not care, they will be out and that's it. They won't think twice. Then is the other camp of people who are uh, more my age. And if the government said today, okay, you can now go to a bar or a restaurant, would I? And uh, the honest answer is I would think long and hard about it. You know, how many tables do they have in there? How are they going to be dealing with serving the food? and maybe wait a few weeks, let's see what other people are reporting back to me. I think there will be slight hesitation, but I also think that will quickly dissipate uh, after a few weeks. So however it looks, I think once we're given the full month to go ahead, um, you know, I'd certainly expect, but well, I'll be out in the first few weeks anyway. And I think, I think most people will. Um, but I think I think they will be slightly cautious to begin with. And it's you know, it slightly weird. I was watching, I'm watching the box set Suits at the moment. And there was a scene last night in a restaurant uh, and somebody came over and shook the hands of, of Harvey Specter. And I was like, whoa, that's a bit dangerous. And I think when we go out, it's going to be a little bit like that. You know, when we're watching um, films on, on TV and there are the restaurant scenes or, you know, you're looking at, tens of thousands of people at the Stretford End at United, it's it's going to be slightly weird to get our heads around this. And actually, um, when we were talking, I don't know if I'm live yet. Oh, I am now. One of the things actually, um, when we were, we were chatting beforehand is, I think, you know, Sasha highlighted a very positive that actually washing hands will become a norm. So when people do go to a football match or a club night, and people are going to the loo, maybe people will, you know, it's a bit of an ingrained behaviour that has now become a positive outcome of this. Um, so moving on from washing hands and urinals, um, why do you think, you've sort of touched on it a little bit already, Sasha, but, you know, we've been doing these webinars for, uh, you know, uh, over a month now, and we always ask our guests about why do you think Great Manchester and Greater Manchester is in a different position to other places in the country. You've touched on obviously us having a very, very strong leader and voice in, in Andy Burnham, but what were the other things you believe that will, will put us in a really strong place, and particularly for the hospitality and nice economy, um, uh, part of the economy, what, why do you think Manchester and Greater Manchester is better placed than other parts of the country? Believe it or not, that's my landline. I still have a landline. Should I just turn it off quickly? Sorry. No, to not. So now I can only speak about nighttime economy. Um, you know, I don't know 
fully other sectors, so it wouldn't be right for me to talk about other sectors. Um, and I didn't go to university, so I'm not I'm not that intellectual to have a stab at them anyway. What I would say is this: wherever you go on on holiday, and I've said this many times. Wherever you go when you're on holiday, and somebody says, "Oh, where are you from?" and you say, "Manchester." We are always associated with two things, and that is our football and our music. And, you know, music is in our DNA and our creativity. And I think the reason for that has to be the fact that during the, the 60s and 70s, um, the North was, and, and still to an extent now, was pretty much left alone to our own devices. It was very, very much London centric. So we had to create our own entertainment, our own parties. Um, and, you know, for me, when I was 17 and I was at school, to my delight, not to my parents, but to my delight, it, it coincided with what we call Manchester. So the period of the Hacienda, Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, New Order, Factory Records. And I was fascinated by that. You know, I was not interested in the slightest in English lit, geography, Latin, I liked art, that was cool, but the rest of it just bored me, you know, I wanted to be part of the scene um, and that's, that. I owe my career to that. But I think, you know, we are extremely passionate about our culture, our music uh, across this city region and I think that's why I know I am extremely confident that our hospitality industry will not only just come back, but it will come back bigger, better and bolder as well. You know, we always do that. And I've spoken about it before. One of the most horrific things I can remember was the original IRA bomb um, outside Shamble Square, outside Marks and Spencers. And although nobody was injured at all, um, as in killed, it absolutely decimated the city centre. But I tell you what, when that city centre came back, not only did it come back, it came back tenfold. And you know that the architect behind that not the literal architects, but the brains behind that was Sir Howard Bernstein with his team. And whether you like it or not, you know, pre then, you would never have had Armani or DKNY or, you know, all these big brands were not even looking at Manchester. And it was the inspiration of our leaders redesigning this city centre that did it. So I know we're going to come back better. I know we'll come back much bolder as well. And I, I am trying to imagine what it's going to be like for me as a promoter to put the first warehouse project back on. And I am going to put a party on clearly when I'm allowed to, whether it's warehouse or not. No one's going to stop me, it's going to happen. And, you know, I know thousands of people will come to that event and they will spend time with their friends who they haven't seen for weeks, maybe months. And how amazing is that going to be? I think it's going to be, I think there'll be a lot of tears actually at that party. Um, I'm absolutely convinced because it, it'll be a really weird, weird sensation. Um, I can't wait for it. I'm looking forward to it. I already know what I think what the lineup will look like. Well, that's. Um, I was going to ask you that actually, Sasha, because uh, well, first I hope we get an invite to that party because it's giving me a little goosebumps thinking about having an amazing party with everybody uh, in the in the region. But you, you know, you said that almost you, it feels like you feel confident by the end of the year, we might be in a position to have such a, a big gig or and I think, you know, I was reading some of your comments in the MEN at the weekend and you talked about, um, you know, the sort of signal of this being sort of the new phase in terms of, you know, returning to the new normal was when there is a gig at Old Trafford's or um, STRs or whatever that might be. And I, I wanted to, before we jump into questions from conscious of time, and me and you obviously could talk for a long time about this, two things I wanted to ask you, and then we will just cover off some of the questions that have been coming. A, who would you love to headline that gig? And B, you did um, something on your Twitter the other day where you asked people um, where they would most like to go for uh, their first meal out or first drink. I don't necessarily want to put pressure on you to choose names, but I thought it was amazing to see you have almost like a thousand respondents, I think, on that. But I would like to know, who would you like to be headlining that first gig back in the city? So I think it would be um, unlikely, but if I had a magic wand. So here's the thing, every single day I have a pinch me moment when I drive out to the drive because 
as I said, I didn't get any A levels. I didn't go to university. My, I have always loved music and I've always loved Manchester United. And my neighbours now on my road, I've got Johnny Marr on one side and I've got Paul Pogba on the other. And I'm like, how did this happen? You know, I'm expecting someone to knock on the door and go, oh, it was a joke. Um, but, you know, it, it, it pinned every day. I, I just found phenomenal. Uh, it's been such a flu. But I think if I could, if I could reform a band and put them back together, that to me shouts Manchester, it would most definitely be the Smiths. And whether you like Morrissey or not, you know, he has said some ridiculous things of recent. But as Tony Wilson quite rightly said, you have to take the artist away from the art. And the art that the Smiths created, you know, I could listen to it. It's, it's timeless. You know, I could put it on now. Um, and in fact, behind me, I don't even see that CD stack thing. There's some Smith stuff in there. Uh, you could release that today and think that it's been written this week. It's phenomenal. So if, if I could reform, well, it's never going to happen, but if I could reform the Smiths, it would be that. And to answer the question about where would I go for a meal? I think it would probably be wrong for me to, to do that. Um, but there were so many, yeah, there were a thousand people that responded to that. And I'll tell you how that happened. I was sat outside there with Demi. We were having um, a glass of wine at the end of the day. It was a really sunny day and we were just debating where should we go for our first meal? And I was like, I really don't know. And I, I just put it on Twitter and then it's like bang, 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 bang. It was all coming in. But what was really nice about that with so many operators sent me a message to say, do you know what, we've seen that and that has really given us some hope and it's cheered us up because we now see we've got so much love out there for what we're doing and although times are really bad and we've got no money and we don't know if we are going to reopen, it's given us some hope so they really appreciated that um, and it's, it's again it's just kind people across our city region. And then I was going to say, I mean, I'm similar to you, Sasha. I'm a United fan, so sorry for anyone who, who isn't on this uh, call. But I would love to see this as the reason to get the Gallaghers back together. So if you can make that happen, even as a United fan, Sasha, that would be a great outcome of, you know, yes, the last few months. Really, it's <laughs> really weird. So in fact, uh, Noel was releasing a track tonight at midnight, an Oasis track that's never been heard before. It's an exclusive you're giving us, or is it out there? No, it's out there. Um, okay. But you know what's really weird? So when they split up, it's a bit like a divorce. And when you people divorce, you become friendly with one or friendly with the other, the friends split. So all my friends were like friendly with Noel, and they're all saying to me, Liam's an idiot, Liam's an idiot. And then I've had both Liam and Noel play for me now, both on separate occasions. Liam is the loveliest guy you could ever possibly meet. The nicest, kind, kindest, gentlest person. Um, Noel's a bit standoffish, if I'm, I'm being honest. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, just. I think he puts this persona out there um, where he wants to be like, you know, Manx swagger, but off camera, he's, he's amazing. A really kind person. Well, that's an exclusive for everyone tuning into this webinar today. So, from Oasis, I want to just like cover off. We have had a couple of questions in, um, one of which I feel we've talked about a little bit, but I think it's worth just retouching back on, um, which has come from Azim at Gemini Cleaning. So to your point, Sasha, about sometimes the kind of forgotten figures within, you know, who are making the nighttime economy happen. Um, they are worried as, you know, obviously I'm assuming Azim at Gemini Cleaning is a, a cleaning business with big big um, contracts with bars, restaurants, they're very worried about, you know, how will they operate in the new normal and how will sort of, you know, will there be that kind of uh, contracts being kind of given back and renewed or on pause? So again, I assume, Sasha, that's obviously people like cleaners and those contracts is something that you've obviously been very focused and been championing about as well. So I have to do a little bit of guesswork here um, because, you know, I don't fully know what Gemini do, but if they are a business, which I'm presuming they will go, because you have cleaners that operate during events and mingling around people, but if they're cleaners that go in once venues or, or offices have closed or shops have closed, then I would have thought they're going to be one of the first ones back because you can 
um, clearly keep social distancing. Um, you know, I know gardeners are still working at the moment, and whether they should or they shouldn't, I, I personally don't think why should they stop because they're out by themselves, um, you know, in, in an open space. So, um, yeah, I think I think the positives for a cleaning company is they will be easily be able to show that they can socially distance um, and they, they're integral to the nighttime economy. Um, so I think they're one of the first people who are welcome back. In fact, they'll probably be welcome back before we'd even open anything, to be honest, because that's half the problem. Venues have been lying dormant for so long. When you open the doors, you're going to smell beer and they're musty and stale. So I would have thought they're going in before the actual customers. Okay, good. Well, I hope that's going to help us with Zoom. And I think given them, give the positivity, yeah, like you said, it's people like the cleaning staff and the behind the scenes staff. So you're going to be so essential to get the show back on the road as well. Um, the second one, um, I can't, I don't know who this is from because it's anonymous and it's quite a specific Altrincham question. So obviously um, you, you've you spoken about Altrincham and you also you gave a nod actually. I worked on um, Altrincham with, um, I can't remember her name, but Elizabeth who led the bid team. Um, we were at Visa, one of my clients, yeah, was the uh, sponsor behind Great British High Street. So I was very pleased when Altrincham got that uh, win as well. But there is a question here about, um, as you touched on with Altrincham Market, um, a lot of rates have been raised at Altrincham Market, which is putting it under risk. Um, and the question here is really about how then do we come together to make sure decisions such as this can be challenged and can kind of, you know, stopped is a difficult thing to say, but I guess it's back to that kind of community and kind of championing a cause. I don't know enough about altering him in the market, but I know you do, Sasha. So what would your view on that be? How do we stop things like rates rises at places like altering in market? So I'll give you a bit of backstory on that. Um, firstly, I think the whole rate system is old fashioned. It needs looking at. And I do know that our mayor is lobbying the government to have some sort of form of rate reform. Um, there was an issue that cropped up a couple of days ago in the fact that Altrincham Market received a letter from the government's valuation office to say that for the last few years the business rates had been undervalued and they were going to put them on um, a level pegging with, with other places of a similar size um, and turnover and it turned out that their rates were going up by 484%. Now my biggest issue with that is actually the timing you know, the hospitality industry is devastated. So to get a letter like that, when they, they are operating at a very small percentage with takeaways, but when you get a letter like that, at this particular moment, when people are worried about their business, I think it's highly responsible, irresponsible, sorry, not responsible, highly irresponsible, ill thought out and completely bad timing. Um, as, for the, the, as for the rates themselves, the alternate market were paying £31,000 a year business rates. Now, I think there does have to be a sensible conversation to be had there because um, I know, of, um, you know, Ocean Market is extremely busy and quite rightly it should be because it's a fantastic product, it really is. But they're paying very, very similar rates to a small coffee shop around the corner. So I do think there has to be, a, you know, a, a conversation about it, but I think the time was so ill-judged um, it was incredible. And I, I came out and I did say that last night and this morning on my socials as well, actually. I mean, fancy that. You don't know if you're going to get through this coronavirus period and you get a letter to say we're going to put your business rates up by 484% straight out of the blue. That is poor. That is really poor. Yeah. Um, and actually, um, the person, I said it was published anonymously, but it was actually um, Emma Sheldon who published that question. She's just messaged. So, um, I'm not sure where she's from, but hopefully, Emma, you know you have the support and Sasha, clearly, on this issue. Um, so um, I think we're basically coming to time now. Um, if there's any more questions coming through on here, you've got a, a minute to submit any more. But um, I just wanted to, um, oh, hang on, we have got one more, sorry. This is when my technology of trying to follow the questions and other ones. I have got one more. Let's we'll finish on this question. So this is from Joe Powell at BDO Corporate Finance. 
Um, and I think, Sasha, this is definitely one for you to take, given it's about live events. Um, so Joe's and question... to do with corporate finance. You're screwed. I might be able to answer that. Well, let me read it out and you can decide. Otherwise, I, I'll take a punt. <laughs> uh, for live events that have been scheduled throughout the summer, most operators are trying to postpone these to next year, which obviously you're, you, you're well aware of with Park Life, um, to help with cash flow. So refunds don't need to be offered. Have you heard of any other innovative ways of conv convincing customers not to request refunds? So this is a bit of a, I, I think there's been a lot of reporting about this, whether that's on gigs, the people we bought tickets for, whether that's holidays, you know, you can see it from both sides, obviously the operators, but also the public. So how are you, how are you, Matt? I mean, maybe it's good to put it in context to part life in terms of what are you yes, doing? Really. We're extremely lucky with Part Life um, because uh, they, Martin, who deals with our accounts, actually took insurance out last November, which at the time I questioned. You don't normally take it out until February, March. And the reason he took it out, there were quite a few floods last year, so he was expecting rates to go up. But Martin is now my best friend because he took it out then and we were covered by insurance for Park Life. Um, anyone that took insurance out after 23rd of January weren't covered. So Martin saved part life, essentially. Um, there are many, many festivals that aren't going to return. And, you know, I would say to customers that we were fortunate we could refund every single penny. Everybody, you know, got the money back. Um, a lot of festivals use the ticket for cash flow to pay for the artists, pay deposits on stage and things like that. I know times are very, very hard for everybody at the moment, for everybody, but if you can afford to keep hold of a festival ticket and not refund it because you want to go to that festival next year, whether it's Blue Dot or where, whatever festival it is, if you can hold on to it, do, because you'll be helping so many jobs um, and possibly saving that festival and you know people think of a festival as a little bit of fun where you go and you let your hair down but again I'll speak from personal experience with park life so forget what goes on around my perimeter at Heaton Park but just on that one weekend in Manchester alone we bring in 30 million pounds into the local economy so whether that's hotels taxis new outfits restaurants you know we do that and a lot of people depend on that so it is a much much bigger picture than just going to a festival wearing your straw hat and dancing to some music and and you know so if you can do hold on to it because i think sadly we will see some festivals fall away undoubtedly we will this year yeah and i think that's as true across festivals but also i know there's a lot of people being supporting uh restaurants through buying vouchers for future dates and all of that and i think you know, Sasha's message there about if it's something you love and enjoy and have put in your calendar, be that a dinner with your family or a fest with your friends, I think amount, if we if people can as, as consumers help support those, I think that will be really important. And I also believe that brands and businesses, be that bars, restaurants, shops, who've behaved responsibly during this period, they will see the loyalty and they will see the return. And I think that's around them treating, you know, their employees really, really well, but also being respectful to kind of their customers and what they are able to spend at the moment. And I think, you know, just to, to go back to what Sasha said a few few minutes ago around the generosity of, of Manchester and the spirit of Manchester and the creative community, I think that's why we should all feel really positive as a region that we will not only, you know, survive this but there will be elements who you know create a drive again um i don't know if that's your dog telling us we should wrap up or <laughs> um anyway for anyone who follows sasha on twitter they'll know his uh dash and makes a few appearances so we are coming to the end of um, the webinar so hopefully um that's been a really um useful and informative session i definitely have felt very uh inspired and positive by the stories that Sasha has shared throughout. So I wanted to say again, thank you so much, Sasha, and, and thank you for all of your doing within the, the community and helping kind of the, the Manchester community uh, thrive within this very difficult period. And thank what's you. the final plug on what is it's, yeah, go on. <laughs> Good. So 
all these donations we're getting for United We Stream Co.uk are amazing, the one pound, two pounds, three pounds. But what is really making the difference is money from businesses that can afford it. So if anybody is watching, and I don't know if it's just the three of us sat here talking, but if anybody actually is watching, please go on to unitedwestream.co.uk and just pledge whatever you can. Um, because, you know, it does go, every single penny goes back to people that really need it right now. 70% of that goes to people who work within the nighttime economy. 22% of it goes to the Mayor's Fund, so we're helping rough sleepers at the moment. And the balance goes to a charity called Nordoff Robbins, and they send out music therapists to kids who maybe have autism or something like that. So, you know, we're doing a lot of good work, but we need people to donate to make it really happen. And thank you for today. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and again, you know, stay safe and well and stay indoors and, and everything that we know we should be doing just for a bit longer so we all can go and have that amazing night out that Sasha's promised us. So thank you. Thank you.